like she feels really fortunate and very lucky. She's doing a lot of things that kids just dream of doing, um, traveling overseas and things. Um, I feel she's missed out, but that's just a mo mother's point of view. Anybody who wants to achieve anything in life must sacrifice something. These children have decided this is what they want to achieve in gymnastics at this part of their life, and they've dedicated themselves to this. With every sacrifice I've made, I've gained something in return, because I might not be able to go out with my friends, but then I can go and travel the world and compete and meet new people as well. So it's not really a sacrifice. It's really just finding out what's more important for yourself. And normal people have to sacrifice things for different reasons as well. It's not like we do anything or, like not different. This well-adjusted viewpoint is in stark contrast to the legal battle which ensued in the United States just over a year ago. 17-year-old gymnast Dominique Murcianu ran away from home, then took her parents to court, claiming they had squandered her earnings and robbed her of her childhood. Courtroom differences were eventually resolved, but the case highlights how little control some athletes have in the direction their lives take. Thankfully, this mentality has yet to reach Australia. I'm aiming for the 2000 Olympics, and if I don't make the team, like nobody knows yet, that it wouldn't be the biggest tragedy because I've achieved what I've set out to achieve so far, and I've accomplished most of my dreams, and it would be great to go, but it's not the end of the world and life does go on. Forging ahead with her life is 16-year-old Pauline Zonecki, who retired from her gymnastics career last year. Her goals have turned from Sydney Olympics to schoolwork and a successful modelling career. It was a really hard decision, but I just realised that I wasn't enjoying it anymore. This was probably about October last year. And I'd just be coming into training thinking, oh, this is going to be a bad day. I can't wait till it's over. And this was like an ongoing thing. So I had to sit down and think about why this was like why I was feeling this way. And I just realised that my heart wasn't in it anymore. Her heart now following other dreams. Her thoughts, though, are with her fellow gymnasts. Yeah, I hope they'll get to Sydney. I wish them all the best of luck. They deserve it, definitely. 15-year-old Trudy McIntosh is one of Australia's top hopes for an Olympic gold. On the vault, she is quick, powerful and explosive. Oh, nice roll. She, too, knows the requirements of being an elite gymnast. We know ourselves, we have to come in and work really hard every day, so, yeah, we know what we have to do. The hard work will no doubt reap rewards come September. Her hopes? To come away with an Olympic medal. Definitely in the medals, but I don't know, any colour will do, I guess. <laughs> the recent success of McIntosh and teammate Alana Slater confirms the high standing that Australian gymnasts now hold in international competition. So what's the future for Australian gymnastics? It's a very rosy and bright future. Um, a lot of that developed through the influence of Juping Tien. As she says, it's like planting the seeds and then cultivating the seeds. And uh, we, were, we are reaping the results of that now and we will reap them in the future. Natalie Hawkins with that report and Australia's top gymnasts will be chasing more success at the Pacific Alliance event in New Zealand this weekend. And one of Australia's best gymnasts, Alana Slater, has been dealing with a few flames of her own, 16 of them in fact. Happy birthday dear Alana, happy birthday to you. <laughs> Barely 16 years old, and life has never been sweeter for Alana Slater. The candles are out, but a lifelong wish is burning brightly. At what age did you get the Olympic dream? I think it all started 10 years ago when I first got told, you're eligible for 2000, and that's really been my main goal for 10 years, been training for it. The coaches have always said to me, she's the, been the most focused child they've ever seen. You know, that's her dream and that's what she's gone for and really believe that she can do it. But it hasn't been an easy ride. 
Today, she succeeds on her grace and poetry. She started life as a fighter. An emergency birth, Alana spent her first two years of life on a monitor. She suffered from sudden infant death syndrome, which meant her heart would stop beating, she'd stop breathing, and need to be brought back to life up to 15 times a day. As soon as she started to walk, doctors suggested gymnastics as a way of building her strength. It was a remedy that would change her life. At five, she was asked to join WACE, the West Australian Institute of Sport. At six, her parents, Barbara and Clive, finally agreed. Straight up, jump up. Good. Now, Alana Slater is among Australia's best gymnasts. Well, she's going for the double-double. Wow, first girl in Australia to do that. Oh, well done, Alana Slater. She's currently ranked ninth in the world, our highest ever ranking which makes her our best hope yet for an Olympic medal. That makes me feel very honoured that I'm the first Australian to get right up there in those top ten girls in the world, but I'm sure that it's just a first stepping stone for Australian gymnastics as a whole. What makes her achievement even more remarkable is the same little girl that had to fight to stay in the world from the very first day she was born won the battle only to lose her father Good. in the tragic plane crash in Indonesia right. two and a half years ago. That's enough on beans. Flight 152 was en route from the capital Jakarta to Medan, 1,300 kilometres northwest. No one survived this crash. An Australian champion rally driver, Clive Slater, was killed in September 1997. I sort of thought, well, losing Clive um, might be the very thing that would be the thing to stop her from going on and being everything she could be. But she really turned it around and Up. thought about her father and the person he was and how he encouraged her and everything the that she wanted to do. And she now uses him as her inspiration to go on. Up and push. I think he'd just be really proud of what I've been doing in the last few years since he's been gone. And I, I just think he'd just be so overjoyed. <laughs> Alana Slater is still a young girl with the world at her feet. But the amazing highs and tremendous lows she's seen in her 16 years are more than many of us see in a lifetime. If she achieves her dream at the Games, Alana will have the honour of appearing in gymnastics' premier event, the Olympic Gala Spectacular, a red carpet display by the medal winners. It'll be held on September 26th, the third anniversary of her father's death. I think Alana has come through something unbelievably tough to get there. Um, and I know it'll be really incredibly happy time for her to achieve it, but in amongst it with a, that sense of sadness that Clive wasn't there to see it in person or share it. You know. But I know she'll be thinking about it. Is there a 16th birthday wish, one wish that you have? Oh, I think there's quite a few things that really come to mind. I suppose the biggest one is having my dad here with me, but I know he's here with me spiritually, which is good. Angels never Get up. Come on. For some, like Heather McIntosh, the changes are dramatic. Living apart from her husband and two other children in order to support daughter Trudy, one of Australia's top young gymnasts. It's a crazy life. Heather lives with another aspiring Olympic gymnast, Melinda Cleland, and her mother, Heather. Between them, they cope with 35 hours of training a week, as well as school. I don't know if I'd do it again if I had the choice. And the cliché is true. Success is never overnight. Just ask David Lawson. Parents of, parents of gymnasts are helped by a VIS counselling program. Veterans like Heather warn other parents what they're in for and how to cope. I suppose we worry about it a little bit and we wonder if they're doing the right thing, but you just got to let them go. But if the lows are low, 
the highs are as good as they come. Brings tears to your eyes, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> One hundred of our best chances for Olympic success were selected for this series four years ago. They all spoke to me about their dreams, about bringing Olympic glory to Australia and to themselves. It's their journey we're following. Through the grind of training, the triumphs and setbacks of competition will be there right through to the Olympic arenas in Sydney. But not all our athletes will make it. In 1994, there were 100. Now in 1999, only 33 of the original 100 remain. In a little less than five years, two out of every three aspiring Olympians have now dropped out. The early episodes of this series were about dreams and the attempts to hold on to those dreams. Where once the Olympic goal of our athletes offered them the luxury of years of preparation, now there is only a handful of months and for those who are battling to stay competitive the next few weeks will be crucial in keeping their olympic hopes alive the appeal of gymnastics has always fascinated me it's a sport with enormous athleticism and discipline, but it also offers artistry, a sense of theater, and danger. It also brings to it youth. This is a senior event, and yet the competitors seem impossibly young. What also sets it apart from many other sports is that gymnasts compete separately as individuals, as well as a united team. And it's the team component in Australia's Olympic campaign that's placing our young gymnasts under great pressure. It's vital that they perform well individually at this national competition, but also they must ensure that the collective Australian team makes it into the top 12 countries in the upcoming World Championship. There's a lot at stake. We've got, you know, national rankings and national selections for international events in April at national championships next week so it's pretty important that the girls do well. We're using nationals really as a stepping stone towards our selection for world championships and at the world championships Australia needs to rank in the top 12 countries Good. to get a team for Sydney 2000. And what happens if they don't make that top 12? Well we don't have a team. What do you mean all? we don't have a team? Well only the top 12 countries get to send a team. The top uh, rank was 1991. We go to world top six. That was our ranking, number six in yeah. 1991. And in 1992, in the Olympic, we are uh, seventh place. In a handful of years, coaches like Ju Ping witnessed Australia's world ranking slump to 11th place in the world. We are now poised dangerously close to having our team shut out of the 2000 Olympic competition. Everyday potential Olympians like Katerina Frikettik remind themselves of their Olympic goal. She was aware back in 1994 that Sydney 2000 may be her only game. Are you gonna hold it? Yeah. Does it disturb you when you think that a, a gymnast's life is very short compared to other sporting no. champions? No. no? Mm. That it takes you so long to get to the top uh, it pays off at the end. Does it? Yeah. Well, the Olympic Games are getting pretty close now, aren't they? Yeah, there's a big sign up at the, at the gym saying how many days and 
we drive past it every day when we're like going to training and stuff like that and we just look up at it and think it's come closer and closer every day but it's only next year and you see the facilities are finished and everything and like it's coming closer so it's more realistic now than what it was before at the moment we're not just thinking of the olympic games we have to qualify first so really that's the toughie isn't it Katarina? exactly we're aiming for um the world championships and qualifying a team and you've got to be in the top 12 don't you yeah you do so what happens if you don't make the top 12 then you can only send a certain amount of gymnasts like you can't send a whole team so you can only send about two gymnasts i think it is so what's going to happen to this series <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> well, you better work hard then. <laughs> yeah, well, we are doing, we are working hard. <laughs> and that's an understatement. It's hard to imagine a group of elite athletes working harder than these young women. Even back in 1994, six long years out from the Sydney Olympics, 10-year-old Brooke O'Brien made it quite clear to me where she wanted to go. Um, the Olympics. You can see that far ahead? Yeah. How clear is that in, in your mind? Um, quite clear. I think that if I can believe in myself and, like, push myself to do it, I think I can. Um, I'm told that you have a lot of ability, but we all know it will take much more than just ability, won't it? Yeah. What do you think it'll take? Um, talent, attitude. Just believing in yourself, um, the, the want to do it, um, just believing in yourself that you can. And do you think you can? Yeah. I think that if you asked me the same questions now, it would probably be a lot different. Um, back then I think I said that... I wanted to compete for my country, but now my goal is probably definitely the Olympics, yeah. So it's not just simply representing the country, it's, uh, it's the, uh, well, the dream that you spoke to me about, about being in the Olympics. Well, I've um, pretty much accomplished the first goal, so I guess um, Olympics is the next target. The goal of Olympic competition may still be burning brightly in the mind of Brooke, but so it is as well in every waking hour of each of her competitors. Their desire for a place in the Olympic squad is just as intense as Brooks. For her, this will be a very tough year. I think she's extremely nervous, I would say, because she's smart enough to know exactly where she stands and what she can actually do with the, you know, the start scores and routine difficulty that she has. And of course, she's up against the big girls now, the seniors. Well, that's right, yeah. Now, having to compete senior is totally different. Last year she was junior, this year senior, it's a, a very big jump. The jump from junior ranks to senior competition is just as confronting for all the gymnasts in this series. They've all had a taste of international experience, but this championship will be their first senior competition on home soil. You're watching the national championship for senior male gymnasts. Perhaps not so keenly followed by the public as women's, but just as demanding in time and commitment. And when it comes to commitment, no one has lived and breathed their sport from such an early age than this young man. His name is Philippe Rizzo and is probably our best prospect in male gymnastics. But to say his sport has been his life is not really telling the full story. Gymnastics has been the centre of the universe for his whole family. On the gymnastics floor tonight, you only need to look a little further from where Philippe performs to discover his dad, André, former Australian national gymnastics coach and French Olympian who, along with Philippe's mother, run their own gym in Sydney. And then there's brother Antoine, former elite gymnast, and oldest brother Blaise, only a few years ago Australian champion, watched Philippe's gymnastics development from the beginning. He probably would have been about two or three, you know. 
As early as that? Oh, definitely. Always very focused, even at that age. Everything that uh, I was doing in the gym, he wanted to do as well. We had to stop him a couple of times because we thought he was going to kill himself. <laughs> well, I've been in the gym, you know, ever since <laughs> I was a kid. So basically, I've had gymnastics inputted in my mind as a baby, so it's like a second nature to me. A second nature as it was for all the Rizzo boys growing up. Right from the very start, it was fun as their bodies were prepared as potential champions. From the time my children was born, I used to play with them a lot. And I thought the best time was after the bath when they were all nice and fresh. And I used to do some exercise with them. But when I mean exercise, playing, bending their arms, bending their legs, put their legs apart one way or another. I followed the, the old brother, because they always in the gym anyway, every day. <laughs> Get no much chores. And I never pushed them, I just started to do it by himself. And by uh, doing that with, like a game, they enjoy to do all that movement, even if they are very simple. Uh, so that might be why they do so good in gymnastics. It was good for me because that would now rough coaching like, older people, I guess, about my age. I was just running around doing stuff on the tramp and just mucking around, and they weren't too, too worried about what I was doing until I'd yell out, say, look at this, look at this, and they'll look over and uh, I don't know what they'll be feeling behind, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure they'll be nervous. The family gymnasium that was always a focus for the Rizzos as boys no longer holds them. They've grown older and drifted apart, but when they have the chance to get together, it's just like old times. My brothers come down every now and then on the weekends, we out to dinner. Well, last weekend we went out and saw a concert and because we both try to play music. Like, we're not really musicians, but, you know, we try to we give it a go. I like think to... Blaze would be insulted by that description. <laughs> he told yeah. me he was a musician. Oh, he is a musician. He, it's his profession. But he's not, not very good. You're, oh, yeah, he is, he is good. But he's not, he's not going to be, like, s selling platinum albums. <laughs> little bit better, but still no control on the left. For the time being, Philippe is based in Canberra at the Australian Institute of Sport. I first met him here, and to see him today, it's hard to recognise the kid I spoke to five years ago. Do you think you'll stick at gymnastics? Yeah. How long do you reckon? As long as I can go. About 25. 25? Yeah, How 25. old are you now? 13. That's another 12 years. That's almost twice your life. Do you think you can hang in for that time? Yeah, easy. <laughs> was it difficult to say goodbye to your 14-year-old Philippe when he first went to the AIS? Uh, I never said goodbye. <laughs> um, it was difficult in a sense, then uh, I miss him a lot, yeah, that's for sure. But in one way, I was happy because that's uh, a direction in his life, that's what he wants to go. So there was happy tears and sad tears at the same time. And I think it's very important that you get to read those criteria and understand them. It wasn't quite like a second home, but as luck would have it, to the head coach at the AIS, Philippe was not just another elite gymnast. I've known his family since they first migrated to Australia in the 60s. Um, I wasn't around when Philippe was born, but I've known him since a, a two-year-old. I knew then that we had a person who was very confident in their body skills. He was confident in the gymnasium and uh, it would be a number of years before we'd see him actually competing. When I realised he had talent, then that's where I start to... Uh, I decided uh, then I should uh, put him on a competition. So I start to involve him in a group of boys I was teaching and, uh, and that's how we start. And I think he really enjoy it as much as I did, because he win all the time. <laughs> it was so good. Although his progress has been impressive in the past couple of years, he is yet to make his mark in senior competition. Tonight is one of the few championships left for Philippe to impress those who will eventually select the Olympic team.
It's early days in the senior competition when I notice Alana Slater from Western Australia. Alana has always been good, but her performances in the past 12 months have established her as one of the best in the land. Alana's starting to think that making the Olympics is a realistic goal. Oh, I think I'm pretty well prepared. I'm on the right track and going down the right line, and I think I'll be ready next year for it and for all the trials and everything. So if all goes good, no injuries and no big mishaps or anything like that, I should be right, I think. What do you think you have that makes you that just that little bit better than the other gymnasts that you might be competing against? I don't know, maybe just more potential getting there and just don't think so negative if you fall, just think positive, you've got next apparatus, you did well, but blank that out your mind. So you think it's, uh, it's your attitude that uh, yeah. is your strength? Yeah. When I was little, I had sudden infant death syndrome. Um, my mum found me uh, basically blue in my cot, and so she, they revived me with CPR and took me to the nearest hospital, Princess Margaret. And from there, I had it for two years, and I was on a monitor all the time. And so if my mum and dad wanted to go out for dinner, they had to bring up for the restaurant. And so if they wanted a window view, they'd have to say, can I just have a, a table with a view, two people? Near, next to a PowerPoint so we can plug our, plug our baby in. So. We're back at the 1999 National Championships. And I notice Alana's mum watching on. <laughs> What's it like to watch your daughter perform? nerve-wracking <laughs> I'm a mess um, because I know how much it means to her I know how hard she works and what she wants to achieve I I feel out of control I know it's in her hands and like all mothers you'd love to be holding them and protecting them um, you just have to go on trust but yeah you know, I get nervous but it's wonderful to watch her she amazes me The gymnasium for Alana was love at first sight, right from the moment that she was taken to one at 16 months, because there were continuing concerns for her health. She wasn't growing very well, and it took her a long time to walk. So the Princess Margaret Hospital, which is the children's hospital here in Perth, recommended that I take her to a kindy gym, because I was concerned about balance and coordination. And then when I got to age of two, I just stopped. All the troubles stopped and everything. That was, I think that was a relief, and that I grew out of it. I oh, soon found out she didn't have a balance or coordination problem, and she really loved doing it, so I just thought, well, this is as good as going to a playgroup. It quickly became much more than a playgroup, with Alana being selected by Western Australia to be a member of an elite gymnastics group. Once she entered the elite group, the long hours began. But even though Alana's dad's work took him overseas a great deal, they maximised every moment they could, talking gym and just being together. I always remember my dad going to the airport late at night, taking him there and fetching him again late at night, waking up in the airport and seeing him come through the door. So I think that was a very important time for me because uh, it was like daddy's home again. He'd actually flown home specifically for the weekend and went back um, over east for the state championships, which he won, and uh, he was just like, so thrilled. <laughs> I thought, we're lucky to get him home every time he went away. So he went away, and we went over to America, actually. Alana was selected in the uh, Australian team to go in the Junior Pacific Alliance, which was held in Colorado Springs. And we'll just go to gym like normal, to go warm up and everything, and Kendall just said, let's wait here, Alana, for a sec. I got a phone call in my hotel room to say that something had happened. And then when I saw my mum there just crying, I, I immediately thought, because I hadn't seen Nikolai yet either. I was your coach? With my coach, Nikolai, who went with me. And I knew it was something to do with my dad. And they 
there'd been a plane crash and that date wasn't confirmed, but it looked like all the passengers were killed. Oh, just the shock of the impact of them telling me that this plane had gone down, he was definitely on that plane, it was just horrendous, I think. Um, I remember that that time was just, I, we couldn't believe it. I guess telling Alana was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And then, of course, we had to get on a plane to come home. We always expected him just to walk through that door. And sometimes you would have dreams that you see him coming home. I think I even miss going to the airport late at night to pick him up. I think the hardest thing is um, all the memories we have, like going through photos and seeing him. I even get a eulogy, I think it is, at the funeral. So. The eulogy? Eulogy, yeah. I, I don't know how I did that, but I did. And... What, what could you say? Hard. about to dad's funeral? I don't know. I, was, I think thanking him for everything he's done. I was pretty amazed at how I got back into gym pretty fast. I only had two weeks off. I don't know how I did it, but I did. Alana was able to put this tragedy in her life on hold. She competed successfully at the Nationals. She has built substantially on that since then, joining Katerina, Trudy and Zena from the series in a historic Commonwealth Games team's gold, and along with it, two individual silver medals. But success is a double-edged sword. Along with it comes the pressure of expectations, and no one is more focused than Alana. If Rosalie and Elena thought that their sport dominated their lives, they should meet gymnasts. From the age of about six on average, their life is gym, and more gym, for around 35 hours a week, 50 weeks a year. No, not during gym. I don't, I don't want any boyfriends or anything not during gym. They would be just a distraction for yeah. you that you don't need at this point in time? Yeah, that's my decision that I make. <laughs> is, that, is that a tough decision? Not really, because I'm here because I want to be, and I don't want any distractions while I'm here. Philippe Rizzo's fan club stirs as they see him begin his floor routine. Hello, I'm Philippe, youngest of the Rizzo's. There's nothing the Rizzo wouldn't do for a girl except marry her. So if you don't intend on marrying me, you can leave a message, okay? Do you think that you can get an insight into a person's character by listening to their answer machine? <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, you could. Just depends what type of answering machine it is. What do you think? What, what does it reveal about you? Um, about my answering machine? Your answering machine? Um, well, that... I don't know. It's a bit of a tough question. <laughs> Tonight, there's very little room for humour for Philippe. Every competitor is out to maximise this opportunity to demonstrate their skills. Although the Olympics is not a topic that dominates conversation, it's not far from every gymnast's thoughts. How different from other competitions will the Olympics be? In your opinion. How different? Well, yeah. The start of the Olympics only comes every four years. It's in, it's in Sydney, my hometown. <laughs> so there's, it's, and it's the, the major in gymnastics for me. I've always, ever since I was young, I've always aspired to do the 2000 Olympics. I think I'm at the right age where I can be at my peak. And do you have any goals? Any real goals in your mind? Uh, to go to the Olympics. 
the Olympics. Yep. Which one? Uh, Sydney. But uh, I think he will never make a shame of anyone by uh, being at the Olympic game and compete for Australia. But if Australia, he makes, if he makes the yeah, team. Yeah, uh, I think he will make pride of a lot of people anyway. So that's the most important thing anyway. I'd be pleased if he does make it, and I think his brother would be very happy. <laughs> his father, much more. <laughs> So you think that he'll be at his peak by the, the 2000 Olympics? Yeah, he's be just, be just there. Be a bit short, but he will be there. What sort of a gamble are you prepared to take at those games in 2000? Um, well, I wouldn't want to be taking any chances at the Olympic Games. I would, if I can do it in training, you know, 99% of the time I'm going to put it in my routine. If I can't do it that much, I'm just going to take it out because I want to do six routines, hit six routines, everything perfect, and see what see the end result is. Hitting six routines with next to perfect scores is all that can be asked of any gymnast. Although Philippe tonight was not performing at his very best, he began this routine close to the medals. The women's gymnastics competition is reaching its final stage. And it's been a mixed night for our young gymnasts. Nerves seem to be affecting everyone. I've seen Katerina perform better. And Brooke has had better nights as well. Alana has put in a solid performance until the beam. Alana gives an indication of her tremendous resilience and brilliance on the uneven bars by delivering a perfect 10. It's a different story for Trudy, last year's junior champion. She's clear leader when she begins her bar routine. If this major error affects this brilliant young gymnast, no one could possibly know. All top flight gymnasts like Trudy have been trained from day one to keep their emotions in check. Trudy puts this disappointment behind her and moves on to the beam. Trudy posts a perfect 10, the second and only perfect 10 of the night. And now she's the best senior gymnast in the land. It's not Philippe's night tonight. After a pretty ordinary performance on the floor and the parallel bars, Philippe begins his high bar routine. The Rizzo family realise now that Philippe's chances for a medal are remote. But the arena is about to be held spellbound as Philippe performs one of the best high bar routines seen in an Australian championship for years. Philippe to snatch the bronze medal.